Welcome back. As we heard last night from the Archbishop, Pope Francis' reassessment of nuclear war was necess necessitated by changes in the geostrategic situation since Pope John Paul II and the U.S. bishops first articulated a conditional acceptance of deterrence. To lead us in the discussion of those changes, we have a panel of experts on proliferation and disarmament, chaired by Leon Ratz of, of the Nuclear Threat Initiative. Leon Ratz is a graduate of the International Studies Program at Boston College. I'm glad we have some, someone to carry the BC banner here, Leon. Echo Eagles. Echo Eagles. Um, and uh, at NTI, the Nuclear Threat Initiative, Leon is the Senior Program Officer for Materials Risks uh, Management and an expert on, on Russian nuclear strategy and disarmament policy. And I'd, I'd like to now invite John Carr to, to, bring the, to, to introduce the group, the panel. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is John Carr, and I'm director of the Initiative on Catholic Social Thought and Public Life. Uh, we had the contest for the most boring name, and uh, that's what won, but it describes what we do. Uh, I've had the honor of working with many of you and coming to respect many of the people in the room for many years. I was uh, director of the modestly titled uh, Department of Justice, Peace, and Human Development for the U.S. Catholic Bishops Conference. So uh, it's a great honor for our little initiative to uh, be a co-sponsor of this. I want to join others in thanking Drew and, and Ruth and the, the Koch Institute and others for making it happen. I, I come, before I introduce the panel, just second to offer a couple small signs of hope. Uh, somebody last night does said with great passion, I'm sure he's here, that wouldn't it be great if Georgetown in its investment policy would avoid investments in uh, those who manufacture these weapons of mass destruction. And we've already accomplished something by gathering here. Uh, this is, I'm reading from the Georgetown Socially Responsible Investment Policy, part of my work here is to serve on the committee which works on that. And it says, uh, the university shall use reasonable efforts to avoid investments in companies that have demonstrated records of widespread violations of human dignity. As examples, this includes companies that are directly and significantly involved in the production of weapons that are intended to be used for indiscriminate destruction. So. Uh, we're moving down that road, and I uh, hope we could be an example for others. The other thing, and some of you were a part of it, uh, Marie speaks eloquently uh, about uh, nonviolence and peacemaking and uh, on occasion pacifism. On Monday night, we had more than 600 people here for uh, a new film on Dorothy Day, Revolution of the Heart. Uh, and on Tuesday evening, downtown, we had more than 100 young leaders. Uh, so the message of nonviolence, the message of commitment, one of the people, the great panel, Robert Ellsberg, who's known to many people here, but we were very honored to have Dorothy's granddaughter, Martha Hennessy there, who talked about uh, the fact that she is facing up to 20 years in jail for her protest of these weapons of mass destruction. So a little bit of hope. Uh, Georgetown does not invest in these companies, and the message of nonviolence is being shared more than 700 people this week. So it is uh, my task to in introduce the panel. I would just want to say a word about the context. This has been a surprising 10 years. If you were to list the most surprising things, I think uh, two things would be the election of an old Argentinian Jesuit as Pope, uh, who among other things has called the church to work for a world with no nuclear weapons and challenge the morality not only of the use of nuclear weapons, but also their possession and even deterrence itself. The other surprise was the election of a TV star, a real estate tycoon, 
to be President of the United States who's taken a somewhat different approach, pulling the United States out of treaties, talking loosely about using nuclear weapons and saying we really need to invest billions and billions of dollars in more uh, of these weapons. American Catholics live in the gap between the leader of our church and the leader of our country. And so the rest of the day, I think, is not about the morality of deterrence and possession and use. I think we agree on that. It's not about our goals. It's about how we get there. And what are the steps? Uh, I was very struck by the comparison to the environmental movement, which in many ways shows people every day how they can move to this. There are alternatives. Uh, there, are, there is wind and solar and geothermal, and there is a Green New Deal, whatever you think of the specifics of that. So what are our steps? If we go into the parish and say it's wrong to have these things, and they say, well, how are we going to protect ourselves? We have to be able, as was suggested earlier, to talk about that in a way that is comprehensible, in a way that is persuasive to people. And so in doing that, uh, we have several panels for the rest of the day. Uh, let me first introduce uh, Alexander Bell, uh, who is the Senior Policy Director at the Center for Arms Control and Nonproliferation. Uh, she, she works on bilateral and multilateral arms control and nonproliferation. She has been a senior advisor to the Under Secretary of State for Arms Control. Uh, she worked at the Center for American Progress at the Plowshares Fund. Uh, she graduated from the University of North Carolina. She was a Peace Corps volunteer in Jamaica. A lot, a lot of people deeply committed to peace have had experience of serving uh, abroad and more of that. Uh, she's been widely quoted and published as an expert in these areas. Uh, Dr. Richard Love serves as a professor on peacekeeping stability operations at the U.S. Army War College. And he's assistant director of peacekeeping of the Stability Operations and Peacekeeping Institute at the War College. He writes at the intersection of international security and law, the law of armed conflict and humanitarian law, sovereignty and instability. Uh, he is, has been an adjunct professor at um, Law and Policy at Catholic University and at Georgetown. Uh, he uh, has written about humanitarian crisis, including the nuclear crisis in Japan. So he brings uh, expertise in law and nuclear policy and his experience in teaching at the War College. Leon Ratz is our, mo Ratz is our moderator. He's a senior program officer for materials risk management at the National Threat Initiative. Uh, he works on materials, he works on Russian nuclear security and nonproliferation matters. He worked for the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory on Russian national security. He, as Drew mentioned, uh, he holds the banner for Boston College and another small university in the Boston area, uh, what's it called, Harvard. Uh, He's a member of the Truman National Security Project. So we have three distinguished leaders, uh, voices who can help us close the gap between what the Holy Father is calling us to and the policies our nation stands for in the world. Join me in welcoming our panel. <clears throat> Okay, I'm Rich. <laughs> nice to meet you. Um, competition. That's what the Pentagon's all about right now. Okay. How do we compete across multiple domains with our friends, Russia and China? our friends, right? So I've been asked to talk a little bit about um, deterrence. 
what does beyond deterrence mean? Right, that's the title of this conference. I was struggling with that. What does that mean, beyond deterrence? Compellence? What do you want to get beyond? Okay. So um, I have my prepared remarks, but I would like to leave you with a couple of initial thoughts. One, managing risk. Have we forgotten that? Deterrence. What are we deterring? Risk. How do we manage that? There are very few, how can I put this? There are very few people who understand that concept of risk, managing the risk in this administration, okay? Um, sometimes they'll reach out to people like me, you know, I'm an Army War College academic, okay? Sometimes they'll reach out and say, what does managing risk look like? And the reason that I bring this up is because beyond deterrence as a concept really challenges the folks in the White House right now. Like I said, I have prepared remarks. I'll get to those in a minute. Um, what about the nuclear risk? What about 56 million people in China locked down right now? Can you get your brains around that? Okay. That's what I'm talking about, managing risk. 56 million people locked down in China? Are you guys paying attention to that? Consequence management, Okay, I can't help myself. Do you know how many times during the Obama administration, do you know how many times he ran a nuclear exercise in eight years? Any guesses? 20, 15, how about once? Okay, how about this current administration? The reason I bring this up is because when you're talking about the nuclear risk, do you know what we're talking about? Do you, I mean, we forget in the beauty and the artisticness of talking about law of war, just war tradition. Do you know what we're talking about? Nuclear annihilation? I mean, do we forget that sometimes? No, we don't. <laughs> no I, I, think, uh, I think we don't. I think in this group, we don't. Okay, but we have to remind ourselves what we're talking about here. So my students are colonels and generals. Okay? It is real for them. It is real for them in a way that I can't even understand because they have to prepare for it and they have to be ready for it. Anyway, like I said, back to my paired remarks. Um, 
But I don't want you for, to forget for one minute when, you know, I'm... Do you know how weird it is to be the professor of peace at the War College? I mean, come on, <laughs> right? You know, um, it's a tough sell. Um, but peace, long way of saying, I was talking to the, the commandant of the school yesterday, and he, you know, he remembers what it was like to be a lieutenant and be prepared for nuclear war. And I, you know, we remember, we do this on a day to day basis. So back to my prepared remarks. Um, do you guys know what deterrence is? Seriously, I mean, anybody? What are you trying to deter? No, I know he knows. <laughs> Deterrence. Are you trying to compel? Are you trying to dissuade? Are you trying to persuade? So I've been working on this paper what is deterrence going to look like going forward? What does beyond deterrence mean? OK. Back to my prepared remarks. Ten to 15 years ago, we're in a totally different environment. Um, the amount of data that is out there now, massive amounts of sensing. Everything senses. Is that good for nonproliferation or bad? You ever think about this? Your phones. Everything is sensing. Right? Now, is that good? Or is it inaccurate? Is the information timely? Spoofing? false information. The reason I bring this up is because right now we are in a kind of a transient state where proliferation, proliferation prevention, okay? Do you trust the private sector? You know, do you understand the information that's coming out? Tons of information, but it's not easy. Um, artificial intelligence. Haven't heard a lot about that, right? Um, what does it mean? So, give you an example. When I was at the Pentagon, um, we, uh, we, dealing with the Fukushima crisis, I was the, the, the lead for the Fukushima crisis. And do you know how much data comes at you? How can you deal with 600 emails a day? That's policy. That's what your policy guys are dealing with right now. Um, so long, 
long story short, um, I got to the point where I just wanted to know, are things better today than they were yesterday? Right? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Right? Is that really what we need to be doing uh, and giving our policy directives? I'm, I'm, I'm getting the five minutes here, and I've got like eight pages to go, so. Um, real quickly, Russia. When we're trying to figure out how to negotiate with our colleagues in Russia, consistency, verification, right, all the stuff. Lack of transparency, there is a worsening of our mutual understanding of our motives and our objectives. And, you know, I used to have the head of the Russian um, rocket forces was a student of mine at NDU. And too much to say. How do you deal with how do you deal with sensitive information? How do you deal with trying to work with the Russians to instill I think I'll leave you with this a sense of urgency, dealing with the experts, and Are we, as a community, elastic, agile, persistent, and creative? Okay. This is a challenge to us, to you, to me. Can we think about a plan B? Can we think about an arms control, non-proliferation future that doesn't look like what we're used to? That is what I've been trying to talk about and write about. What does that look like? What does that future look like? It doesn't look like it doesn't look like what we're used to. It's a new reality. It's a reality where drones can totally change the dynamic and they can blow up, they can blow up things in Saudi Arabia, okay? What does that new reality look like? I've, I've been told and like several times now, so. But, but seriously, what does that look like? We determine it, us, you. It is a new reality. Anyway, thank you.
Good morning. Uh, thanks again for having me here again. Um, it's a, really a, a great opportunity to talk with a different group of people than we usually get to talk to here in DC and the nuclear policy community. It tends to be a little bit uh, insular and we go through things, but I honestly think we need to expand the conversation if we're gonna deal with the threats that we're dealing with uh, in the nuclear space and beyond. Um, the state of arms control, I'm afraid to report, it's not good. Uh, that said, I am an eternal optimist. I think we actually have the ability to turn things around. Um, not only because we're capable of that, but we have to turn them around. Uh, the upcoming anniversary uh, of the Trinity test and the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki should serve as an, an opportunity to renew and enhance risk reduction measures, to challenge assumptions about the past and the future of nuclear weapons, and to rebuild the human infrastructure needed to deal with the nuclear threats of the 21st century, while at the same time working to renew public interest in the fight to save ourselves from ourselves. Uh, with each passing day, the likelihood that a nuclear weapon will be used uh, due to accident, miscalculation, or madness goes up. Like Chekhov's proverbial gun, nuclear weapons have been introduced into the global scene. If the status quo remains, another one will eventually go off. That fact used to drive leaders and their publics to action. Now it's buried under a thousand more pressing problems. The world has seen the kind of global destruction, uh, disruption that can come from terrorist attacks on people and infrastructure. That kind of disorder and fear pales in comparison to what the single use of a nuclear weapon would do to military and economic and social structures, including civil liberties. Um, no country is prepared to mitigate and manage the aftermath of a nuclear detonation. Even faced with the law of odds, countries must still do everything in their power to stop a nuclear detonation from occurring. During this time of global tension, it's fortunate that most nations around the world, including the five nuclear weapon states recognized under the NPT, appear to agree, at least in principle, that nuclear risk reduction should be a top priority. Um, in practice, unfortunately, many nations have, have forgotten old lessons. Uh, even with focus and attention, today's leaders have another problem. Uh, th they're stuck in a theoretical rut. Uh, the fact that a nuclear weapon has not been used since 1945 is often taken as unquestionable, unquestionable proof that the theories and concepts on nuclear weapons were and remain correct, even with ample examples of near catastrophes. There is little room for the idea that the world has simply been lucky. Uh, the last decade has seen the casual reemergence of nuclear warfighting planning despite the complete lack of empirical evidence outlining how a nuclear war could ever be controlled, much less won. Suggesting that the world has been guessing this whole time is tantamount to heresy among the nuclear priesthood, but failing to re-examine and if necessary, rework the theories that have dictated the nuclear age uh, invites disaster. While many international leaders acknowledge the changing nature of warfare and new, how new technologies will affect the way countries engage in conflict, the status and need for nuclear weapons is still seen by many leaders as non-negotiable. Nuclear weapons are indiscriminate destroyers of life, infrastructure, and the environment. It is time to start really discussing why any country would actually choose to use nuclear weapons given the less devastating and less attributable options available in the 21st century. The most pressing reason for upending or reworking current policies is that after decades of progress towards reducing nuclear threats, the world is now heading in the wrong direction. Arms control and non-proliferation efforts are stalling or failing, and as we see with climate change, many leaders seem willing to make, unwilling to make hard but necessary choices about the future. Uh, one could make the case that all nuclear weapon states are equally to blame for the current impasses, but to paraphrase George Orwell, um, Animal Farm in particular, uh, some countries uh, are more equal than others. Uh, as has been the case for most of, or all of the nuclear age, the United States and Russia possess over 90% of the nuclear weapons in the world. Their inability to talk substantively about the nuclear future is the biggest obstacle to progress, and it imperils every human being on this planet. Uh, as leaders in Washington and Moscow and around the world start to think about the next 
75 years of the nuclear age, perhaps the best thing to do is start with a basic question. What are nuclear weapons for? The next step will be to discuss issues like ambiguity. Nuclear planners have long thought that it was advantageous to be unclear about when and why a nuclear weapon would be used. Is that still the case? Was it ever? In a multipolar world rife with weaponized disinformation, would it be better to be absolutely explicit about the circumstances under which a country would risk triggering an all-out nuclear war? So what do we do? Uh, I think sometimes it's best to just start with small steps, basic steps, uh, and here uh, delineating a singular action and then building upon it um, to the next step is, is probably the best case. So what is that? Extend new start. Do it today. It should have been done years ago. Uh, with the collapse of the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, New START is the last bilateral arms control agreement between the United States and Russia, uh, given, as I said, that these countries possess over 90% of the global nuclear arsenal, capping these stockpiles um, and extension is just common sense. Without New START, every country, every person on this world is less safe. Uh, the easiest way to accomplish this is for President Trump and President Putin to simply meet and agree to extend the treaty. I advise that they do it in some gold dip room covered in marble and fancy chandeliers and you can make, take a lot of pictures uh, and everybody can go home with a win. Um, the obstacle to this is currently the US desire uh, to cover more nuclear systems uh, and to pull China into a binding arms control agreement. Um, I think the United States is playing with fire here. Uh, I'm not a gambler, I've heard it's a sin. Uh, but I know about gambling enough to know that you never put things on the table that you're not willing to lose. I do not think it's in the interest of the United States to lose this treaty. This treaty is working. The limitations on deployed strategic systems benefit us. They benefit Russia. Uh, further, there's absolutely no reason to lose constraints on 1,550 deployed strategic nuclear weapons just because there are other Russian and Chinese nuclear weapons that do not fall neatly within the confines of New START. Uh, that's like quitting your job, assuming that you'll win the lottery. Uh, the United States should take the proverbial bird in hand and then move on to larger arms control discussions. C China absolutely can and should be involved. Um, but then the U.S. is really going to have to consider what does China want? What are we willing to put on the table that would pull China into an agreement? Further, you don't start with a nuclear reduction treaty. That's not how we started with the Russians. We don't even have a hotline set up with the Chinese. We don't even have enough interpreters at the State Department, I'm guessing, that are fluent enough in Mandarin and strategic stability to be able to go to the table and negotiate a treaty today. We've got infrastructure problems. Um, next up, we need to manage potential crises. As I said, the INF uh, treaty ceased to exist on August 2nd, 2019. Um, I think this treaty could have been saved. I think the United States and Russia resigned themselves to losing this treaty. Um, nevertheless, the consequences uh, can and should be managed. The United States and Russia should publicly outline their short-term plans on intermediate range missile production and deployment. In addition to that transparency effort, the two countries should also open a conversation about post-INF measures for guarding against an intermediate range missile race. That could include geographic restrictions on deployment of new IR missiles uh, or prohibitions on placing nuclear warheads on said missiles. Uh, longer term, the United States and Russia should work to, sorry, to include other IR producing missile nations, uh, particularly China, in such a dialogue. Uh, I also think leaders in Washington and Moscow should be able to uh, credibly brief uh, MPT parties at the upcoming RevCon about their plans to deal with the aftermath of the collapse of INF and, uh, and their plans for going forward. Uh, in a few weeks, the P5, the permanent five members under the MPT, nuclear weapons possessing states, will meet in London. Um, I'm not sure that we're going to get a whole lot out of this meeting, but I am hoping that they will be discussing a set of common understandings that would help to reduce nuclear risks. Um, many of these have already been established in previous statements uh, in general uh, internal doctrines, um, but during this particularly tense time, reiterating these common understandings in explicit detail would be both timely and necessary. Uh, the process of creating these mutually acceptable explanations is a confidence-building process in and of itself. 
uh, they could reiterate or explain their support for the following statements. A nuclear war can never be won, so must never be fought. We intend to extend the 75 years of non-use of nuclear weapons forever. We will not conduct explosive nuclear tests. We will not place weapons in space, nuclear weapons in space. We will work to ban the production of weapons grade fissile material. And we are committed to the long term health of the MPT and acknowledge publicly that more progress needs to be made on disarmament. Uh, while none of these statements would fundamentally change uh, our current status quo, their reiteration and re-emphasis can serve to lay a better foundation for more substantive discussions going forward. Uh, the extension of New START and the adoption of these shared principles would represent a positive step forward. They are insufficient to the challenges presented by the new global security environment. Um, it is inevitable strategic stability will be reshaped by emerging technologies. The potential negative impact of the new tools of war and the new domains of military conflict uh, on nuclear stability cannot be understated. With this in mind, both nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear weapon states can work together to create and uh, engage in a sustained dialogue about the future of arms control. Uh, no matter the venue, new dialogue should be created to address the connection between nuclear weapons and drones, precision strike weapons, hypersonic weapons, ballistic missile defenses, and the connections between offense and defense, lethal autonomous systems, and artificial intelligence. Um, ad hoc dialogues with or without government participation can also be formed to discuss the form and function of asymmetric arms control agreements. Uh, the P5 should also commit to begin discussions or new joint statements that can take into account these new risks to strategic stability. Um, further, given the potential uh, for catastrophe, there is a pressing need to uh, explore restraint against uh, the targeting of nuclear command and control systems with cyber weapons. At the same time, nuclear weapon states should be working with non-nuclear weapon states to establish confidence building measures that will help the international community manage the connection between nuclear weapons and advances in cyber technology. Nuclear weapon states can also preclude concepts before they even become a problem. I like to call this uh, preemptive arms control or preventive arms control. Uh, for example, um, I would like to think that no country would think it was a good idea to put a nuclear warhead on a fully autonomous delivery system. Um, nevertheless, let's just go ahead and ban that before it becomes an issue. That's actually something that could create some space where we have sort of obstacles on you know, regular arms control. Let's go and, and forge some new paths. Um, averting a, a problem like a, a fully autonomous nuclear weapon seems like common sense, but I feel like we're lacking common sense right now. It's a, in a bit of short supply. Um, and finally, most importantly, the P5 must commit to foregoing expansions of their individual nuclear arsenals past current numerical limits. Um, instead of trying uh, to create a new way to slow arsenal expansion, I, I think countries should actually look to the past here, specifically uh, talk about the strategic arms limitation process and how those negotiations, subsequent agreements, and lessons learned can actually be applied today. Uh, Richard Nixon, when talking about New START, uh, said it's the beginning of a process that is enormously important that will limit now and we hope later reduce the burden of arms and thereby reduce the danger of war. Um, it's hard to imagine a more apt description of what the P5 should be doing today. Um, some of the aforementioned uh, ideas and concepts may work, some may not. Uh, what is certain that without renewed public interest uh, in nuclear threats, nothing will change. I, I can't believe people aren't in this debate more often. It's literally a matter of life and death. Um, but yet I feel like we actually have to try to convince people to even listen. Uh, most importantly, um, if the publics around the world are demanding accountability from their leaders, their leaders will listen. Uh, member of Congress, uh, members of Congress are rarely asked to explain their votes on nuclear policy matters um, or how they're individually helping to reduce nuclear risks. U.S. presidential uh, candidates are asking the American people to trust them with the sole and unchecked authority over the 4,000 active weapons in our nuclear stockpile. They're rarely ever asked about how they would handle the nuclear stockpile. Uh, with the 2020 US elections coinciding with the 75th year of the nuclear age, the American public should start asking about the costs, the risks, and the long-term plans associated with nuclear weapons. Uh, it's also incumbent upon civic and religious leaders and communities to weigh in on an issue 
that along with climate change represents an existential threat to mankind. Uh, solidarity across communities, denominations, and faith uh, would have a massive effect on how leaders are talking about and dealing with nuclear weapons. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, the upcoming anniversary of Trinity and the bomb, uh, Trinity and the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, are an opportunity for reflection and re-engagement. Um, upon observing the world's first nuclear test, many Manhattan Project scientists saw the end of the world. Uh, the seven billion people on this planet uh, can accept that future. Uh, or they can choose another path. I refuse to believe that the best we can do uh, in terms of security for this world, for, their, for our nations, is to promise unending doom forever. And, and that's, that's all we can do. I, we are capable of more uh, than this. And, and the law of odds is not on our side. We have to change the way we're thinking about this. Um, and leaders and experts of all stripes need to be working together. Um, but people need to be demanding uh, this of their people. That, that is how we change the fate. That is how we renew an arms control process for the 75th and continuing year of the nuclear age. Thank you. Thank you, Alex, for that really outstanding, uh, comprehensive look at the arms control and nonproliferation landscape. And thank you, Richard, for really placing uh, all of these challenges in, uh, in a rich intellectual context. Um, so we've got about 30 minutes for a uh, Q&A session. I'll, I'll start off with a few questions of my own, and then I will turn it over to the audience. Uh, and I'll start off by doing something that's fairly dangerous in the policy world, and that's uh, some prognostication. So I'm going to ask our, um, our distinguished panelists to uh, assess the likelihood of, of the following scenarios. And I'm just going to go through them, and then after um, after we go through each one, uh, at the end, we will, uh, I'll ask you for, for comments as to why you uh, assess these uh, the way you did. So the first one, um, how do you assess the likelihood of new start extension before it expires? Alex? 50%, uh, 70%, 80%, 20%. As I said, the president could do this today. Uh, if he wanted to, um, he has not seemed interested in extension thus far. Uh, the good news is that the president is very mercurial, um, so it's hard to see where, where he would necessarily go. I hope that the people inside the U.S. government are making the case um, that this is in our military interest, this is supported by our military, supported by our intelligence community. Um, this gives us insights into the Russian strategic arsenal that we can't get any other way. Um, and even if we tried to pay for it, it wouldn't be as good. Uh, as what we're getting for free. Uh, I think it needs to be sold to the president as, as sort of a, um, this is a win that would be uh, lauded by the entire international community. Um, you could make it bigger than simply extension by having some sort of chapeau, political commitment on top of it, uh, reiterating some common understandings, committing um, you know, as leaders in Washington and, and Moscow to try to pull uh, Xi Jinping into a conversation, um, you know, and, and, and do it in a really fancy room um, that, you know, looks good in a, in a photo op and, uh, and, and extend it, take the win. Um, if the president chooses not to extend the treaty and is not reelected, uh, there will be 16 days with which a new president could move to extend the treaty. Um, so I think people in the, uh, in the arms control community that are interested in extension have been weighing out these various ways forward, um, I won't make a prediction. I would just say I hope <laughs> that uh, logic and reason prevails and that we extend the treaty. And well, OK, well, if I could ask you, do you think it's more likely than not? I think it's more likely. OK. I, I think that if there is an attempt by this administration to, to give a good college try to getting a trilateral agreement off the ground and it doesn't really work because it won't work, um, then they can go back to the White House and say, we tried, but here's this other thing that we can still do. Um, so I, I hope uh, that that's how it goes. And uh, like I said, I'm an optimist. So I, I would like to think that things will go well. OK. <laughs> Richard, the likelihood uh, let, of the start extension? Right. Let, let the president have his win, right? So um, I'm more cynical, OK, uh, than you, Alex. Uh, I, I don't think this is. I don't think this issue is rising to the level of pain 
right now for the administration. Um, but man, wouldn't it be great? Just let him have his win, right? I mean, that that's that's kind of how you have to build. Um, how you have to build new start, right? Sure. So, you know, um, we all win. So, so I, I I don't mean to be too cynical, but. Um, you know, we need to be building the argument as a community as why we need to be pushing this, why we need to be doing this, why this is in the, you know, why this issue um, has, needs to get his attention, okay? And you know as well as I do, I mean, the folks at the NSC just aren't paying attention. Right, and we need to push if we can, because this is this is a win for all of us. Right, <laughs> right. I mean, this is a no-brainer. Sorry. <laughs> I actually have a plan to get a lot of ads on Fox News over the next couple months. <laughs> right. Anybody wants to contribute to that effort? Um, how about the Iran nuclear uh, deal, the JCPOA? Obviously, under a lot of strain. Um, what, how do you assess the likelihood that we'll see the total collapse of the JCPOA in the next year? Well, Alex? optimistic, cynic, so um, Alex? It, it's definitely gonna be a hard issue. I think our allies uh, and partners that remain a party to the JCPOA um, are trying to find a way forward. Um, I think uh, for a long time, the Iranians were trying to hold on um, and stay in the agreement with the hopes that eventually uh, the U United States would join. But they have their own problems at home, hardliners who are saying, look, this is proof that we should have never made a deal with the United States. Um, you know, they're not monolithic, uh, which is a mistake I think that people make here all the time when talking about Iran. But um, I, I guess I would say it's, it's, I'm more hopeful that New START will be extended than I am that JCPOA can survive through the rest of the year. That said, um, I think there is no path to, to controlling uh, a nuclear weapons program in Iran without a negotiation. So if we manage to, uh, to lose this, we're just gonna have to go back and try to negotiate again. Um, and I hope that's clear to whoever in the administration is dealing with this. There, there is no military solution. Okay. We'll return to, the, to some of your points on JCPOA later on, but Richard? Who are we talking to? You know, I mean, at the end of the day, um, Geostrategically, who are we talking to, you know, in Iran, right? I mean, I don't have a good answer for that. Um, but but um, I know that, you know, through places like the Vatican and other, you know, there are channels where we can have conversations. Um, it worries me because kind of we, we don't know where the next drone strike is going to be. Right. And um, it's very hard to teach law of armed conflict uh, at the War College. Um, when you never know what the next strike is gonna look like. Does that make sense? Sure, absolutely. Yeah. All right, well, last question this series. Within your lifetimes, the use of a nuclear weapon? I mean, there have been various studies along the way that have shown that uh, the odds are, are not in our favor and that eventually, again, using that Kennedy phrasing of accident, miscalculation, or madness, um, we could see an accident. Um, I, I, we can prevent that. We, ha we have that ability. Uh, you know, I think that previous administration's efforts to lock down Fasan material uh, around the globe to, to prevent access 
uh, to fissile materials uh, in order to stop non-state actors from acquiring this capacity uh, was important. Um, I think, you know, unfortunately that job is never done, and so that's a problem we need to keep reminding Congress and reminding the administration. Um, Non-proliferation is forever. Nuclear security is forever, and it is expensive, and, and, and you have to keep, and, and winning means nothing happens, and it's hard to go home and sell that to your constituents that, like, nobody used a nuke this year. Like, I, I helped do that. Like, it, it doesn't play very well, but, and unfortunately that's the world that we're living in. Um, I, God, I hope not. Richard? Zero so is it 0% or 100%, right? I mean, that's <laughs> really what we're talking about here. There's no halfway, you know, either a nuclear weapon will be used or it won't in my lifetime. Um, now, I plan on living for another 150 years, so, <laughs> you know. But, no, ser seriously, what are we forgetting here? You know, I mean, that's, those are the stakes. I mean, you know. Um, I remember back in escalation ladders and, you know, demonstration nuclear detonations, right? So we were gonna demonstrate, really? Right? I mean, you work for the undersecretary, you know, you plan this stuff out. Really? So is it 0%? Is it 100%? I hope it's zero. Well, as do I. A um, couple more questions, and we'll turn it over to the audience. Um, Richard, you brought up the, the uh, issue of memory uh, yeah. in all of this. And uh, you, you talked about the anecdote of, of the um, of your colleague from the Army War College who remembered when he was a lieutenant preparing for nuclear war and therefore he understands why this issue is so important. And I think many of us in this room might have certain experiences uh, in, a, in, in uh, your lifetimes that have motivated you to think about nuclear weapons. And for a lot of Americans, uh, that experience is the Cuban Missile Crisis. For some Americans, it's the Cold War and living through the Cold War. But young folks, folks who are studying at Georgetown, have no memory of the Cuban Missile Crisis, have no memory of Abel Archer, have no memory of the Cold War. So my question to our panelists is, without that memory of, of that kind of fear, how, how do you think we can engage young people? How do you think we can inspire young people to, um, to care about these issues? Alex? Um, I've, I've heard of a attempts to, to engage young people by talking about nuclear weapons as issue zero, that everything else that you care about, whether it's environment or social justice or you know, equity in our economic system, like n none of that matters if we don't get issue zero right, which is to you know, stop a, a, you know, a global nuclear war. I think um, it's also just exposure. You know, we need, uh, it's not just engagement with academic communities or civic communities. Like, we need to be engaging with like artistic communities. Actually, in, in fact, nuclear weapons used to be sort of, and the, and the threats of them infused in a lot of uh, culture beyond um, academia and, and sort of policy wonk world. And uh, we don't have that right now. We gotta find ways. I, I think and it's, it's also just getting people to these places. I, you know, having visited Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the Marshall Islands and downwinder communities in, um, Utah and the test site, you know, it changes when you actually go to these places. It changes to, to walk through you know, the museum in, in Hiroshima and, and see the damage caused by, by the bomb there and the damage caused in our name. Um, that, it's, a, it's a powerful feeling. Um, I was actually really worried because it was a, a, I was walking through the museum with a lot of you know, my superiors and they're mainly men and um, I was definitely starting to cry, and I was like, get it together, Belle, like, they can't see you cry. <laughs> and then I see, and there are, all, there are all these fathers, and we had gotten to the part of the museum where there was the children's clothing on the wall, and all the fathers were just, you know, in, in tears. And I was like, ah, like, for once, I'm not the only person <laughs> who's moved to tears in a place like this. And um, I, I just finding ways to get people there. And, and we have this problem not only with nukes, but, like, 
the further away we get from World War II, there's a myriad of issues that people are starting to take less seriously, talk about less. Um, that's a challenge for our society in general, and, and I think you know, colleges and, and universities and, and young people um, engaging on those campuses is probably a good place to start. Sure, Richard? I, you know, Alex, I, I, how do you grab people, right, to this issue? Um, you know, there's so much going on, right? So many things going on. Why is nonproliferation, arms control, what's going to grab you, you know? And... That's a that that that's a challenge. So you know, at at the War College, um, I used to have twenty students with a waiting list. How about now? Seven, eight. You know, mostly international fellows because they're all from India and Pakistan, <laughs> right? Um, so how do you how how do you grab people? I I don't have a good answer for that. Um, what I've, what I believe is there is, you know, at the end of the day, no trans, th there's no threat like the nuclear threat. Um, but I can't. How can I put this? I'm, I'm having a hard time um, grabbing people and their interest. You know, it's great that the Pope and Archbishop Tomasi, you know, is here to tell us about deterrence, lest we forget, right? Lest we forget really what is on the table here. Um, that said, social media, everything else going on, it is still, as you said, Alex, you know, the farther we get from World War II and the tremendous horrors that, you know, the world suffered. People, 50 million people dead, World War II. 50 million people. How can we forget that, you know? And with the prospect of a nuclear holocaust right around the corner, you know, I wish I had a better answer for, sure. for you, sir. And if I could just follow up, uh, Alex, you, you mentioned um, going to Hiroshima and uh, walking around there. And, and when I was there, one of the feelings I had was, frankly, one of shame. And the reason I felt shame was because um, we can look back on certain very, very dark moments in, in modern history, say like the Holocaust, and there is no, there's practically no debate about what happened there and how awful that was. But we look back on the, the only two times nuclear weapons have been used, um, and there is a debate. And so I'm curious what your thoughts are on how significant is it that our government has not apologized for, uh, for taking those actions? Mm. And how significant is it that there seems to be you know, various shades and various sides to this debate about the use of nuclear weapons back in 1945. Mm. Um, so the American government does not apologize a lot. Uh, <laughs> I did a lot of research into this, actually, when uh, we went to the Marshall Islands uh, for the anniversary of the Castle Bravo test. And uh, you know, I, had to, I was a speechwriter, so I was preparing remarks uh, for Rose to you know, acknowledge what happened. But you know, it gets very difficult to uh, apologize, state of war, all of these things. Um, so I actually looked back at, at various things we said about uh, the three times we have apologized was uh, for slavery, for treatment of Native Americans, and Japanese internment, um, and kind of looked at the phrase. And I don't really think even in any of those it said sorry. Um, but it did acknowledge uh, that we had made, as a nation, the wrong choices. 
And I really commend to you President Obama's speech at Hiroshima. And, and honestly, getting him there was not an easy process. This was the majority of my time at the State Department was this little seed of an idea of maybe he can go when he's in office. And that was like a six year process from that idea to actually getting him physically to Hiroshima to make that speech. And, and if you haven't read it, um, he talks about like, not only was this the dawn of the nuclear age, but in some ways a dawn of a, a moral awakening of the, what we had done, the, the drive to get bigger and bigger weapons, and this is what it wrought. And, uh, and since then we actually have in many ways, uh, pulled ourselves back. And, but again, we're forgetting those lessons. So if you haven't read those remarks, I highly recommend them. But um, it, we are an imperfect nation uh, full of imperfect people. But I, I do think that, uh, that we try. And I think what we did by sending President Obama there to deliver those remarks opened up a space for uh, Abe to go to Pearl Harbor and give a similar speech in the hopes there would be that the North Korean or the South Koreans and the Japanese could have a broader dialogue, a more uh, communicative dialogue about what happened in World War II. So, uh, you know, leading by example, we can actually push other nations to, you know, talk about things that are hard to talk about. World War II was terrible. We all did terrible things, um, and so it's our goal now to to not do those things anymore. And Richard, uh, just take nukes off the table, right? I mean. It, at the end of the day, um, no first use. You know, let let let's cut through um, a lot of the, you know, um, historical legacy here, and let's start fresh. What do you really want to do? No first use. Okay. Let. You guys have a problem with that? I mean, right? You know, and let's, you know, start a dialogue fresh. You know, um, you're the moderator. I, I will defer to you, but I, I think that's what's needed right now. It's, it's, we have an opening. We, we can actually start thinking about, okay, Do you know what the biggest problem at the War College is? What does strategic mean anymore? <laughs> right? So, so literally, if, if we can't answer that, you know, um, we got a problem. Right. So, so what is strategic dialogue? What is strategic deterrence? What does strategic, strategic, strategic now mean Okay, in a world where you've got artificial intelligence making all of our decisions for us and Amazon, you know, will deliver our, you know, meals for us. You know, so it's a new reality and we are lacking with intellectual curiosity to meet that challenge. All right, let's go to questions. We'll take a three at a time. So uh, let's start right here, up in the front. Thank you. My name is Pierre Vercotre, and I'm com coming from the Catholic University of Louvain in Belgium. And I'm also chairing the Council of Research Council from the International Federation of Catholic Universities. Uh, as I'm probably the only European here, I first want to raise uh, a concern felt in Europe uh, as far as nuclear weapons is concerned, especially when an international treaty um, has been pulled out by the main decision makers, the International Nuclear Forces, which was signed in 1987. And what I can tell you is that as far as nuclear disarmament is concerned, this is certainly less popular than it was before in Europe, and that there is a growing concern in Europe about security issues. And uh, people are more and more ready to accept governments investing more and more in defense than before. Let me just give you an example. Uh, in Sweden, they recently decided to reinstate compulsory military service, which was uh, abandoned years ago. So that means there is a growing concern about security. But basically, our debate here about arms control, non-proliferation, 
and even disarmament is mainly between state actors. One of the first questions about state actors is how successful is non-proliferation today? The second question of the debate is considering, uh, Richard, one of the questions you raised about non-state actors, about the complexification of security issues. How can we address arms control with growing impact of non-state actors in this debate? And especially in Europe, we felt very strongly the crisis of Syria in this respect. All right. And then the lady right up front. Thank you. I'm Diane Perlman. And um, I started in 1983 as a speaker for Physicians for Social Responsibility on the psychology of the arms race and uh, the image of the enemy and also active in Psychologists for Social Responsibility now at the School for Conflict Analysis and Resolution at George Mason. Um, so just one comment that deterrence, in addition to being immoral and illegal, is also irrational. And there's a very rich body of work from the 80s um, on deterrence theory and spiral theory. I have a very fat book that I used to teach a course edited by Ralph K. White on psychology and the prevention of nuclear war with like Jervis, Mort Deutsch, Ned Lebo. Um, and you asked about deterrence, that it means the way I understand it is that um, I'm sending you a signal that if you that I if you attack me that I can retaliate so you better not attack me, but if if I act according to deterrence theory and if you see me building up my arsenal you think I'm getting ready to attack you, so then you you better build up your arsenal so the dynamics can flip into like to spiral theory. Um, so anyway, there's a lot. It's very accept sort of like mindlessly accepted as as a thing in, in Washington, and it's, it's flawed theory. Sometimes it holds up, sometimes it breaks down. Um, the other things you said, like what, what are weapons for, that the way I see it, there are three uh, major forces towards um, developing more nuclear weapons. One is financial, is the weapons contractors making hundreds of billions of dollars, and for that we always talk about conversion, but I don't know what's up with that. Um, the second one is domination and coercion, which also provokes an opposite reaction. And then the other one is uh, the belief in the rapture, that there are people who believe in the rapture. And they used to be on the fringes, but now they're in, you know, like Pence, Pompeo. Like it started with Ashcroft, so now they have sort of more access, and you can't logically reason with that, you know. So Armageddon. All right, let's uh, take. Uh Two more on, on the left side here. Yeah. Um, my question's real simple. Uh, your advice on the upcoming NPT conference, which is, I think, going to be incredibly contentious, number one. Number two, um, why there was a meeting of the state's parties of the Middle East recently to promote a nuclear weapons-free zone in the Middle East. Iran participated, Saudi Arabia participated, Egypt, all the countries in the region participated, and there was no coverage whatsoever in the media. And I just wondered if you could help explain or give some ideas of how we could overcome that. I went to that conference. It was extremely hopeful to see all of them seriously addressing that issue. And it was amazing to hear Egypt uh, parallel the Treaty of uh, Tlatelolco, which which, be, which was entered into force before Brazil and Argentina joined. And they paralleled that and said, well, we could do a treaty before Israel joins. Other countries who were spoilers, like Saudi Arabia, said, well, we shouldn't really do it until we get all the parties. So we saw where people were coming from. It was very revealing, and it wasn't covered. And it's going to say a lot, oddly enough, going into the NPT conference, which most of Washington is insensitive to the dynamic of that issue, because it was part of the promise in 95 for the extension of the treaty. Uh, so I wanted your advice. The second is Article 6, Clause 2 of the Constitution, not Article 6 of the NPT, which we all deal with. But I, I, I've been a law professor, and I consider the supremacy clause of our Constitution extremely important. How do you teach that in the War College when, when there's such a uh, diminution of attention to the supremacy clause in the supreme office of our country. Our, 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 because you know all of the officers that you're teaching swore an oath to uphold the Constitution. 
which means they have duties to uphold treaties. And yet we have a president who's treating treaties like uh, real estate negotiations, or even less, just you know, a barroom talk. So I wondered how you address that, how, how central that is, because that's the oath they take, that's what they're putting their lives on the line for. How, how, how central is that in the teaching in the War College? Right, and any other questions? Right here. Uh, okay, we'll just do one in the back, sorry. <laughs> we haven't heard from the back yet. Hi, uh, my name is Kara. Um, I am a junior in the School of Foreign Service, so I am one of the Georgetown students who doesn't remember the Cold War, <laughs> primarily because I was born after it ended. Um, but I am, a school, I am a student in the School of Foreign Service, and it is something we learn a whole heck of a lot about. Um, but within the, it, within the nuclear space, the dialogue is kind of narrow. Um, and not that this is necessarily something I believe, as I think it's going to be a pretty unpopular opinion, but I'd love to hear what your responses would be, because um, a lot of the prevailing literature that we read sees nuclear brinksmanship as um, the only solution, that once technology has been invented and adopted, you can't get rid of the knowledge. You can't get rid of the institutional know-how that's built around nuclear war making. So what is your response to the idea that once we've crossed this threshold, which we have, there's no turning back, and that nuclear brinksmanship is actually a form of risk management in itself? All right. We've got a lot of interesting questions on the table. So I'm going to let uh, Richard go first, and then Alex go second. OK, I quit. OK. <laughs> I, I, I don't even know where to, to, to start. Um, So I'll, over to Alex. <laughs> uh, so I'm half European, if that helps. Um, I think it's uh, imperative that uh, Europe and the United States uh, and Russia uh, think long and hard about the future of conventional arms control in Europe, because I think that's actually the major driver of risk there. Um, and INF has just made the situation worse, um, as has the Trump administration's musings about withdrawing from things like open skies. Um, we need to get creative. Uh, we need to get some young people in the room. We need to get some technical experts in the room, along with diplomats who go through some of these new technologies uh, and ways we can better improve conventional arms control in Europe. Um, Non-proliferation has been amazingly successful. At one point, we thought there would be 50, 60 nuclear weapon states. There's nine. That is not great, but it's a lot better than where we thought we were going to be. Um, but as I said, it's a forever process. Uh, the good news is uh, when c people talk about countries like Iran and North Korea. There are no other countries like Iran and North Korea right now. Um, so let's deal with those two problems. I thought we had done a really good job with JCPOA. Uh, unfortunately, we're in a different space now. But uh, manage those problems and then keep it up. Uh, we'll always uh, have to worry about this. Uh, but I think we've actually done better than sometimes we give ourselves credit for. Uh, on deterrence, um, I, I, Mutually assured destruction is not something we chose. We're here. It's a state of being. Like we have to deterrence has to be maintained because we're not getting rid of nuclear weapons tomorrow. So manage your current situation while also allowing yourself to imagine a, a different world. That's that's where we got to be. Um, at the MPT, uh, I think it's important for all parties to be looking for common ground, um, to not be jerks to each other, um, and needlessly provoke each other, spend entire sessions airing grievances. It's not helpful. Look for constructive places, agree to disagree. Um, and I'll trust Egypt more about its disarmament uh, commitments when it joins the CWC and the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. Um, but I do think the Middle East weapons of mass destruction free zone is a necessary process. Um, we just have to get all parties to the table. There's just no way around that. Uh, and on Nuclear brinksmanship, nuclear brinksmanship. Um, I get asked about this all the time. Like, how is nuclear zero possible? Like, won't you know? Won't we? We can't put the genie back in the bottle, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I have no idea what the end of poverty looks like, or what gender equality looks like, or, or you know, a, a world where where we have rolled back uh, the dangers of climate change. It doesn't mean we shouldn't be going there all the time. I don't know what nuclear zero looks like. It's still where we have to go. And uh, no, nuclear brinksmanship as, as a theory means eventually we will get into nuclear war. And to me, that's unacceptable. So one thing I'll add, thank you, Alex. Um, we haven't talked a lot about the 
you know, extended deterrence guarantee, right? And what that means, what that could look like in the future. So um, when I go to Japan or when I'm going to NATO or with our allies, guess what they want to talk about? Guess what they want to talk about? They, they, they want to talk about, is the president walking back extended deterrence? Okay, and for, you know, that's a critical question because that will change the geopolitical balance everywhere, okay? So if the Japanese are asking me, so where's the president stand on extended? I'm not the guy that they should be asking. Okay. But, but, you know, three years ago, make America great. Does that mean we're walking back from Europe? What about? We just put a brigade in Poland, okay? So we're obviously interested in some of those geopolitical dynamics with the Russians, okay? But I'm, I, I'm putting this out here because you're getting mixed messages, right? So on the one hand, it's, hey, Rich, Do you want this Japanese colonel to come to the war college for you or not? You know, I mean, well, yes, of course. Um, but let's think about the messages that we're sending. Because on the one hand, make America great again. Well, I thought we were always great, so, um, you know, how is that being received? How is that being received by our foreign friends, right? Coupled with um, some of the new and diverse threats that we're dealing with. So, sorry, I, I got it right. Um, well. I think that's about all the time we have for this session, so would you all join me in thanking this fantastic panel. <laughs>